Welcome to Field Sports Britain. This week I'm going to Scotland where we're devoting the entire programme to a man who wants to put buzzards back on the vermin list. The beautiful Scottish landscape is facing threats from people who claim to be its friends. The RSPB and others are monstering gamekeepers, even though it is gamekeepers who do most to keep Scotland looking as glorious as it does. There are politicians who want to end estate ownership in Scotland, even though it's thanks to the estate system that gamekeepers have their jobs. The shooting community is fighting back, and among us is one organisation that punches well above its weight. I'm on an estate in Peebles in the Scottish borders to meet its gamekeeper and the head of the Scottish Gamekeepers Association, Alex Hogg. This place, Charlie, is 7,500 acres. We've got ground going up to over 2,000 feet. My house is 1,000 feet. So it's high ground. Peebles is a high county. Um, it's a good mixture of, of stuff. We've got a few walked up grouse. We've got a good pheasant shoot. We've got the topography for it here. We've got roe deer, fallow deer, an odd seeker, um, odd cover a grey partridge and it's a lovely estate. You've got a bit of, you've got the, almost all of Scotland in one 7,000 acre plot haven't you? Ah, it's, a, it's a bit mini, mini Scotland, <laughs> yeah. No. Um, and so it's walked up grouse um, and what sort of size pheasant days do you do here? We do about 100, 150 bird days, just just family days and everybody thoroughly enjoys it, good, good high pheasants, they're well earned. <laughs> And there's even a lock in the background here, so you've got a, you've got a little bit of fishing too. Uh-huh. We have some uh, brown trout, rainbow trout, and a f there's a few pike in there that people are keen to catch and the fly. So, no, it's a nice wee lock. Good. Um, and you're very, very handy for Hollywood, which is Aye, part yeah. of your job now. <laughs> yeah. So, the... describe, describe uh, what you do for the SGA. Well, I'm now chairman of the SGA. I have been for the past 10 years, and that entails at least a couple of days a week going to meetings or going into Parliament. Um, because I live handy to Parliament, they, they thought I'd buy a deal for that job. So we've built up a good relationship, a good cross-party MSPs in the Scottish Parliament. And it's a good thing we've got the Parliament because I don't think we could have worked as far afield as Westminster. So um, it's, it's been a long, hard fight. One of our biggest victories, I suppose, was the dog bill. It was introduced as a private member's bill back in 2000, and they wanted to ban hunting with dogs. Well, we fought hard to keep our terriers, and also hounds could hunt out a fox to, to guns. So it worked out well for everybody in the finish up. We lobbied hard so that they would still be able to hunt with a pack of hounds in Scotland. Mm -hmm. As England, I think, is allowed to hunt with two hounds. Yes. So we right. could still use the pack to hunt out big forestry blocks and things, as long as it was the guns. Mm -hmm. So that was important. You're not short of political organisations and you're not short of countryside lobbying groups either in, in Scotland. There's, there's Basque in the Countryside Alliance. What's, what's the difference? I think when we go into Parliament, you know, the word soon gets around, the gamekeepers are in. Uh, you know, we were the guys with dirt under our fingernails, really practical men, and we always speak the truth, we always speak for the heart, for what we've seen, and I think it, it stands us in good credence for, the, you know, f with all these MSPs. So they like talking to real people, real Scottish people, and there seems to be a feeling in Hollywood that they don't like what they perceive to be the kind of English laidocracy. So are you saying that other organisations seem to represent that too much and you are you are the real people? Aye, I mean, we were certainly we were working class, if you like, and especially with a lot of Labour guys in, in Parliament that could see it as being... There's this mindset within Scotland where they would like to get rid of private estates. But I used to work for... You know, I started off, my father was a shepherd and I worked for the Laird, and when I left... My first, I was four years as an underkeeper, and then I went to work for the Forestry Commission. And a lot of my friends said, well, you'll no need to tough your hat to the laird anymore. But um, I found out quickly that when you worked for the Forestry Commission, you had a laird just as bad as any laird ever 
<laughs> saying. So no, it doesn't matter who owns the ground. It, as far as I'm concerned, it could be owned by Martians. As long as they invest the money into the countryside, that's the important thing. You can keep in touch with Alex and the work of the SGA on its website, www.scottishgamekeepers.co.uk. That's where you'll find Alex's blog. And if there's one theme he comes back to again and again, well, here's a quote from that blog. It's Buzzard Central here and they're not just predating the release pens. Only an hour ago I watched one fly off with a poult it killed within a few yards of the garage beside my house and I'm pulling my hair out with frustration. Like some of the politicians Alex comes up against, buzzards are both a nuisance and, for no very good reason, untouchable. Woman buzzards... <laughs> One of the SGA's near misses at Hollywood was buzzards. Can you tell me what happened there? Well, what happened was we were in the final stages of drawing up the final draft to have a protocol in place that would trigger a buzzard licence. In past years, I've applied for a licence. They could never make up their mind what would trigger it. So they just had to dot the I's and cross the T's and they decided basically that if you had serious damage occurring and it was projected, you know, it was projected serious damage of 10% of at each pen, yeah. that would trigger a licence. So after you, what you had to do, you had to go jump through all the hoops first off, you had to have your bags up, your CDs, your fishing gut, your hard cover, yeah. try and dissuade them for landing on purchase and stuff. All that was done, and then the chap would come out from the from the office, look at your problem, and they were meant to grant your licence within three days. But there was a couple of poison incidents happened further north, and the minister pulled the stops on it. So. <laughs> what do buzzers do to pheasant pens, to pheasants? They find the young buzzers find the the pen. Once they find the pen. Like last year when I was releasing the ports, we'd actually found it was within the first hour, but a couple of days they'll find the pen, and if there's four young buzzards or three young buzzards, they'll, they've got the patience of a scent. They'll come and sit above your poults and wait until the poults appear, come out to feed, and then they'll drop down and kill the poult. Now that's fine, you know, it can happen every day and they'll eat that poult, but... If you've got bad weather, severe weather, which we did this year, rain and wind and cold, those young pheasants can't feed because of the constant predation. So you end up, you can lose hundreds of pheasant poults because they won't stay and take that amount of punishment. You know, if you're being killed every day, up to two week period, they'll leave. Are they your single biggest predation problem? Aha. Uh -huh. That and foxes, but we're allowed to control foxes. We're not allowed to touch the buzzard. They are serious. And we stand by and watch lapwing chicks being decimated, curly chicks being decimated, all by buzzards. And it, it's serious. The biodiversity in Scotland is seriously being threatened by buzzards. And that's just because they have such protection, there is no way of getting to them. There's no way of, of managing them. Oh, if there was some common sense shown, we don't need a licence to kill that many, it's a few rogue buzzards, it would really help the, the, the whole situation. And you compare that to deer, and you know there's a feeling that the Scottish Government would like to see deer annihilated. Oh aye, sometimes, you know, you'll see them, as soon as deer are mentioned, nobody worries a, a bit about deer being shot. Shoot a seal or shoot, you know, try and protect your pheasant poults, you're in serious trouble. But deer, nobody seems to care. Yet yeah, it's a number one iconic species. It was a questionnaire put out to a thousand people and that's what they said they would most like to see. It takes plenty of drive to go to a government and request a buzzard cull when that government has political lobbying groups on the other side who want you put in prison for any attack on buzzards. Alex has a hard road to travel and there are plenty more problems awaiting him. So Alex, you brought me here to one of the most spectacular views on the estate, but really the future of this kind of countryside is 
is in Edinburgh behind you. What's, uh, what's on the horizon politically? We're going to have a big battle on our hands. We've got the Wildlife and Natural Environment Bill, which we're going to have to respond to. We've done our written response and we're now been called to give oral evidence. There's three th main parts of the bill. There's the deer part, there's game laws to be tidied up, and there's muir burn and, well, there's four parts, as was a snaring. So we're going to have to respond to all this. and. As you can imagine, a lot of the amendments that will go in will try and interfere or ban whatever they can. Well, let's deal with it bit by bit. Let's start with deer. What, what are the risks with this bill? The deer, I think we've managed to get on top of the deer. As an industry, we responded early on and the minister took on board what our feelings were. They were threatening to have no seasons for stags. They were threatening to have mandatory testing, which we've now got onto a voluntary basis. So the deer part of the bill, we're hopeful it should be OK. We've then got the game seasons, which... We're just staying on deer, though. I mean, this sounds like not just anti-deer, this sounds like anti-landlord, anti-laird, doesn't it? Again, it's a mindset within uh, certain parts of the Scottish Parliament and certain people within certain conservation agencies who just hate the sight of deer but you know we've lobbied hard this past 10 years to try and save our poor deer and I think we're beginning to get the message through. And do they just hate deer or do they hate the people who shoot deer? I think the, the, it's total ignorance if we had maybe educated a lot of the middle management you know the students coming out of university they only got told one side of the story so it's ignorance in their part. And once you explain to them just what management's involved, they're all willing to, to listen. Um, and have we got any friends, as far as they are concerned, in Parliament? Ah, we have. We've got some people who are shouting from the rooftop. Some MSPs absolutely love their deer. So yes, we certainly have got friends. Is it is it just the Conservative? Are there any Conservative MSPs? Uh huh. Yeah. There yeah. Are. Yeah. The Conservatives <laughs> and there's Liberals and we've got SNP. And then we've got Labour. And there's, so, a, there's a feeling that SNP is, is naturally the, the friend of, of your ordinary shooter here in Scotland, even though they don't always behave like that, that Labour is generally the enemy. Is that right? Uh, it has been since they got into power. They've, they have got a lot of members or, you know, voters in the rural constituencies, so they've got to listen to them. Have you got any friends in Labour? Well, we've got a few, yeah. We did have a few during the dog bill and we've got a few this time over as well. So tell me more about this, this bill that's going through now. Well, this Wildlife and Natural Environment Bill could seriously affect shooting, fishing and stuff. So we've done with dealt with the deer part. We've got the game laws are going to be tidied up because some of them are ancient, going way back to 17th, eight, well, 18th century. So we'll tidy those up. So is that things like, uh, you know, poaching is a hanging offence and that sort of things thing? Things like that, yeah. Okay. You haven't had many hangings here recently, though. No, no, for a wee while. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we'll, we'll tidy up the game laws. And there's also, I mean, this, the serious thing from our point of view is they would like to make pheasants and partridges non-indigenous, which is quite worrying. They, the, the RSPB and no, other organisations? No, well, the Scottish Government is talking, although they're going to put it in the face of the bill, but I think we'll fight that one and try and still get a recognition there that, that it's still game. I think when it's got that tag on it, it gets more respect. Good. Um, and uh, more burn, more burn. Uh -huh. I think we'll be fine on that one, although the problems are the amendments that come in. RSPB would like to see Muir burn stopped. Why? Well, they reckon it's burning out certain bird species because of global warming, but we've had the coldest winter for 40 years, so... This um, sounds like a straight slap in the face of landowning. Ah, yeah, it's That's just having nothing, us, to, do with, yeah. nothing no, to do with birds, is it? No, nothing whatsoever, it's just an excuse. Um, so what grounds are they putting forward that, 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 it's, that it increases global warming to burn moors? No, that, well, they're saying that birds are nesting earlier, because it's getting warmer, so therefore you, the, the fires will, will burn the, the bird's nest. But we've got evidence from the shooting side that if you have a grouse moor, you get biodiversity, you get lots of birds, and if you don't 
have a grouse more, then you don't get lots of birds. We can feel that, can't we? Exactly, yeah. It's just, if it's left its own devices, it just turns into a barn wilderness full of foxes and crows. Langham one showed that. Langham, this is the uh, Duke of Buccleuch's Moor, uh -huh. which was used to show uh, what happens if you manage and if you mismanage grouse. Uh -huh, yeah. OK, so that's uh, Moorburn and um, uh, snaring. Snaring, we've been asked to train the professionals, which we've done. I mean, we've had over 30 courses now. We've done over 600 people. So you've got to you can snare if you've got a piece of paper? Yeah, you've got to go through. Well, the piece of paper, there's a lot of new, newer legislation, and some of the points are that you cannot put it on a drag anymore. You know, the snare must be anchored. You cannot put it on a fence where it might become entangled. You can put it on a fence as long as it cannot get over the fence or through the fence, and they must be checked every 24 hours, and they must have a stop fitted to them, which is nine inches for a fox snare and five for a rabbit snare. And they're now talking about tagging the snares, which that's still in discussion. We're not just sure how that one's going to work out. But we've kept up our end of the bargain, and we feel that we're totally professional as far as snaring goes now. Um, snaring had a near miss in the Scottish Government earlier this year, didn't it? Aha, uh -huh, yeah. Um, we lobbied hard and the uh, Rosanna Cunningham fought, you know, she put up a damn good fight. For uh, snaring. For snaring. It's not her natural constituency, you'd think, would you? Yeah, well, I think, uh, you know, it was the party line was to stand up because Mike Russell was adamant that we kept snaring. It's a vital tool in the toolbox for countryside management. If we lose snaring, biodiversity is gone in Scotland. Tell me about, um, I mean, there's been a bit of a, a boom in fox numbers this year. You, you, you've, uh, you've had quite a big year for foxes yourself, haven't you? I was just saying that we've had seven litters on the ground and we've just had 25 cubs in the past four weeks since we got the pheasant poults. So it's, it's constant fight to try and keep the ground clear of the foxes, especially at this time of year. And have you had any of those awful moments of going to a, a pen and seeing poults everywhere, dead, killed? I have in the past, aye. But not this year? <laughs> not this year, oh, no. So, but... so you're winning? <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll see. Yep. Um, the other thing, threat, is uh, shoot licensing, things like that. What, the, you wouldn't be allowed to shoot unless you had a licence? Uh-huh, and, you know, and as soon as you have to have a licence, it can be withdrawn and... This is an industry worth hundreds of millions of pounds a year to the Scottish economy, and they want to licence people. Yeah, it's absolutely crazy. So that's why we're lobbying Parliament, because it's vital that we have this money coming into the rural economy. What are their grounds? Is it safety? No, I think it's just another, you know, it's like death by a thousand cuts. Or just dig away at us, slow but sure. And when you say us, you mean the estates? They say it's, and well, the shooting fraternity as a whole, people who are involved in any type of field sport. Now, you are, or well, at least you were when you started this job, just a gamekeeper. Have you become a politician? Well, I would never like to think, no, I wouldn't. I'd like always want to be a keeper. Um, some people have suggested that I become, you know, a full-time lobbyist, but... I'd rather much, much rather prefer my feet on the ground and then you're in touch with the reality of things. So maybe you think you work hard at your job. Well, with his politics and his day job producing great pheasant shooting, Alex Hogg really has got a mountain to climb. And all the time there's a dirty bunch of tricksters wheeling overhead him, looking for an opportunity to attack. <laughs> 